Your life can change. It doesn't have to stay the same. You can break through to another level. You can experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower you to live beyond limits. We're excited about being in the house, and I'm excited about preaching the Word of God once again, and we're talking about the rapture of the church. You know, the rapture is something that among some Christians, some circles, even some preachers and teachers is controversial. Uh, people believe that it's not really a thing, that it's a Christian myth, that it's more about escapism. But the rapture isn't just about escaping uh, the wrath that's coming on the world in the end times. The rapture is a reward for God's faithful people who overcome. It just so happens that in that process, we do escape the wrath that is to come. And so last week, we talked about what the rapture is. And we went to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul actually said, I, God gave me this. This came to me by word of the Lord, because the, the Thessalonians were concerned that their dead loved ones would miss the rapture. And so he talked about the fact that the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So what you see in the rapture is that Jesus descends from heaven into the clouds, into that dimensional space beyond ours, and there's a rapture shout and the trumpet blast and the dead in Christ, our dead loved ones who serve God, they're going to get their bodies back. It's really exciting. It's amazing. And then there's going to be a generation that's living on the earth who will not die like Enoch and Elijah were taken up. There will be a generation on the earth living who will never see death, and they will be trans, uh, translated in an instant, uh, and, and will all be given glorified bodies. And, and then as we're gathered together with the Jesus in the air, then he is going to come and uh, lead us, that we will be with him, and he'll lead us into heaven there with the heavenly Father where we will see the judgment seat of Christ or we'll be judged and rewarded. So we want to make, and the Bible says that you'll be even judged for every idle word. So I'm like, Jesus, I take it all back, and I forgive me, and I repent right now. Come on, somebody. So we want to make sure that we, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to encourage your day to be faithful all the days of your life in an era where everybody wants to be famous. There's nothing wrong with that, but God's not going to say, well done, good and famous servant. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So be faithful. Wake up. Be faithful and go to bed. I know you've never heard that here at our church. Wake up, be faithful, and go to bed. And then but get out of bed and get up the next day and be faithful again. And do it over and over again. Now, today what I want to do is move it a little bit further and talk about the fact that the rapture event, this catching up, this snatching away of the church, is a pre-tribulation event. Now, for those of you who may not know what the tribulation is, the Bible tells us that the last seven years of this age is going to be what's called the tribulation. And the man of sin, which you probably heard this term, the Antichrist, he's known by many things. He's called the son of perdition, the man of sin, the lawless one, the Antichrist. He is going to rise up and he is going to rule over the world in a one world global system. And I think what we, if you're paying attention at all about the World Economic Forum, Things that are being said, things that are being planned, my gosh, they are planning to control the world. And so what we see is the Antichrist, the global system is being built right now for the eventual rise of the Antichrist to rule the, the, to rule the world. And so um, the, it's a seven-year period of time, and it's split up into two, three and a half years. The first three and a half years is an era of false peace where he is like the best politician the world's ever seen. He's the slickest, he's the, he, he's the smoothest, but everything, he, it, it's all a lie. It's all a deception. And then in the second part of the tribulation, which is the second three and a half years, that is where it's going. That, part, that portion of the tribulation is actually called the great tribulation. The second three and a half years is called the great tribulation because God is pouring out his wrath on the world, on the unrepentant world that has rejected him, but the Antichrist is going to, um, in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to suffer a wound, an injury, but he's going to come back from it, and when he does, he is going to be Satan incarnate, and that is when he is going to pour out his wrath on the world. So the great tribulation is the second part 
of the tribulation, the second three and a half years, and the reason it's called the great tribulation is because it's a combination of the wrath of God being poured out and Satan's wrath coming upon humanity. And that's where you see the mark of the beast system is put in place where you have to take the mark and the number of the, uh, of the man is 666, remember? And you got to take the mark. It's going to be on your right hand or your forehead. You can't buy or sell without the mark. Isn't it interesting that now they're talking about and they're, uh, they're coming out with digital programmable currency? Anyway, it's already, these things are already being created. The matrix for the system is being created before our very, we're living in the generation where the matrix for this to happen is being created right before our very eyes. I don't mean to be a buzzkill today. You can still say amen. That's why the rapture is the blessed hope of the church. So we see that also it'll be a one world religious system where you have to worship the beast. You have to worship the antichrist. Now you're seeing the development of AI, and it's really cool, but there's also an element to it where if you read Revelation 13, where it talks about this, that the, if you don't worship the image of the beast, then you'll be killed. And it's like the image itself can kill you. It's almost like a robotic type of AI that's throughout the world that is in the image of the beast. You have to worship the beast or else you will be killed, and the, the image, the thing can kill you. It's just really crazy. But if you see what's happening, we're being plunged technologically towards these things. I don't say that to scare you. I'm just saying that to put a frame of reference. Now, there are Christians who believe that this rapture event is a, or the snatching away of the church from the earth is a post-tribulation event. That Christians are going to have to go through the tribulation uh, and at the end of it, God's going to take us away. And there are some people who believe that there's a mid-tribulation that, remember we talked about the tribulations in two parts, the first three and a half, the second three and a half. In the middle, God's going to take us away before it becomes the great tribulation, the second half. But I'm here to say today, I believe and I firmly believe, and I think the scripture is clear, that the rapture of the church is a pre-tribulation event. First of all, just think about the nature of God. Why would Jesus come and pay the ultimate price and create the church, which is called the Bride of Christ, to only put his bride through the same judgment that the unrepentant world is going to suffer. It doesn't even make sense. What no person would do that to their bride. And you know, the Bible talks about things that are gonna God, it's not that God's just mad and say, Oh, yeah, you reject me. Well, then here's that, and here's this. It's not like he's being petty. We see things about the blood, those who spill the innocent blood, and the blood that's crying out. You think about the abortions and the babies that have been killed. Their blood is crying out. Abel's blood cried out from the ground. Remember when Cain killed Abel? His, God comes to Cain and says, where's your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? He said his blood cries out from the ground. From the time of Abel till now. The innocent blood is crying out, and it's, going, it's like pouring it in a cup. It's a cup of judgment that is just being filled and filled, and at the time, of it, the time of it being filled, that's when the judgments will be poured out. That is why the rapture is a promise to God's faithful people who overcome. Stay faithful in this day. Stay faithful in the midst of darkness because God is going to reward his people and he is going to call us to be with him. And while the seven-year tribulation is going to commence on earth, you and I will be having a partay in heaven. It's called, the, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb that will last for seven years. So I want us to move to 2 Thessalonians. Now last week we were talking about 1 Thessalonians. Paul's first book, it's argued whether it's 1 Thessalonians or Galatians, but either way, it's one of his first books. He's writing 1 Thessalonians because they were concerned that their dead loved ones had, would, would miss the rapture and explain that their dead in Christ will rise first. Then in 2 Thessalonians, he answers more questions. But let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now you see what he's talking about. He's talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. What does that sound like? The rapture. We're going, to be, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. We ask you not to be soon shaken 
in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter. What happened was someone uh, circulated a letter in Paul's name saying that the rapture had taken place and then now they were in the tribulation. So the Thessalonians are freaking out. Their first question in the first Thessalonians was, what about our dead loved ones? Will they make the rapture? Paul answers it, explains what the rapture is. Then in 2 Thessalonians, they're freaking out like, oh my gosh, did we miss the rapture and are we living in the tribulation? So Paul is saying, look, that letter was not for me. It was a fake, all right? Fake news. Come on, somebody. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> anyway, he said, uh, or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. You know, we're living in a day of great deception. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin, which is the Antichrist, the man of sin, he's known by many things, is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. Remember, Satan always wanted to be worshiped. Why did he fall from heaven? Because he wanted to exalt himself above the throne of God. What did he tell Jesus? He said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you the nation, I'll give you all the kingdoms. Bow down and worship me. Throughout scripture, godly angels never allowed people to worship them. They always pointed people to worship God. It's fallen angels that get people to worship them. That's Satan's desire. He wants to be. So notice the Antichrist, this man of sin who say, becomes Satan incarnate. What's he doing? He wants, bless God, he wants to be God. He wants to be worshiped as God. And that's why people will be forced to the tribulation to worship him. And notice what it says to show himself. There's like this thing in him, this rebellion, this pride to show himself that he's God, but he ain't. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, meaning that there's something that's restraining him from rising, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming, of lawless, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So one of the things that we see is the mystery of lawlessness. Remember how in Scripture Paul talked about the mystery of Christ? But it has been revealed. What was hidden as a mystery in the Old Testament is now revealed in the New Testament. But there is a mystery of lawlessness that is still at work, and they keep it shrouded as a mystery so that when the day comes, he can rise and take power. So we see this mystery of lawlessness is at work. And he said that there's going to be great deception because he's going to come with all signs of power and lying wonders. And so we see all kinds of things he's going to do. And that, that, that phrase, lying wonders, actually even means celestial sightings. So we see there's going to be all kinds of deception. And so anyway, as I was saying earlier... 1 Thessalonians, Paul is talking about the fact that you didn't miss the, uh, your dead loved ones will be in the rapture, this catching away of the church. And then in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, he provides an explanation of the end time events. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, he gives a sequence of how the rapture will take place. Go back and watch last week's message, and that'll, if you missed it. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he talks about uh, uh, an end time events that are going to occur. And he mentions the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is not the rapture. The day of the Lord is Christ's return to the earth. So there is a difference between the rapture of the church, where the church is taken away to meet Jesus in the air, and the coming of Jesus to the earth. So one, the rapture is God coming for his saints. Come on. But the second coming is God coming with his saints. That's exciting. There's a difference between the rapture is God coming for his saints. Jesus doesn't touch down to the earth. He just goes into the air, and he calls us up to be with him. He's coming for his saints. But in the second coming, Jesus is coming back. Come on, somebody, all the way to the earth, and he's coming back with his saints. That is what Elijah, uh, that's what Jude said Enoch prophesied, and he's quoting the book of Enoch when he said, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, 
prophesied of these things that, behold, the Lord will return with, come on, somebody say with. He's returning with 10,000s of his saints to execute righteousness and judgment on the wicked. So when you and I come back, we're coming with the Lord. That's why there can be no such thing as a post-tribulation rapture. Why? Because at the end of the tribulation, Jesus, it ends because Jesus comes and ends it. At the battle of Armageddon. And guess what? You come with him. So go see Miss Regina and learn how to ride a horse. Because you're going to come back on white horses. Come on, somebody. It's awesome, isn't it? The Bible's amazing. It blows your mind. It's so awesome. It's, it, it's, it's, it's great to serve God. So what I want to do in just describing the fact that it's a pre-tribulation event is just look at this scripture just one second. The first thing I want to point out is that the falling away, number one, the falling away or the departure. And there's been a, there's been a misreading and a misunderstanding of this verse. In some translations of the Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is presented under this heading of the great apostasy or the great falling away. And you see that in King James Version and in the New King James Version. The great, is it okay if I just teach you something today? Is it okay? All righty. So it's important to come to church and learn something. Amen. So the great falling away. Now, what we see is it'll say great falling away. When you, when you turn the page of 2 Thessalonians 2, it'll say the, the great falling away or, or the great apostasy. But what we have to realize is that there's confusion over the phrase falling away. So in verse 3, Paul said this cannot happen until the falling away happens first, meaning that, what's he answering? He's answering the fact that you didn't miss the rapture and you're not in the tribulation. In fact, this can't even happen until the falling away happens first, then the man of sin will rise. So this term falling away has confused a lot of people over the years. Now the word for falling away in Greek, the New Testament is written in Greek, is this word apostasia. It's apostasia. It means a falling away, but it doesn't, it means even more than that. It actually means a departure, right? It means departing, a departing from it. And it can mean multiple things in Greek. It can mean a departing from a person, departing from a faith, or departing from a physical place. It can be departing spatially. And so in 1604, I don't mean to sound like a history lesson, but the Bible is a history book and you need to learn something. So I'm going to teach you today. You're welcome. In 1604, King James of England commissioned scholars to translate the Bible into English, and, it, and, and they, they commenced to do that. So by 1611, they come out with what? The King James Version of the Bible. Thou hast said unto me, O Lord, you all know the these and the thou's in the old English. My father grew up on the King James Version, so when he would uh, quote things by memory, his default was, King James. I grew up New King James Version, so when I quote things from memory, it's more of the New King James Version. So anyway, you just, they, they just put it in a more common vernacular. And then now today, you have more, by, uh, more, more translations, like the NIV, people have teased the nearly inspired version. That's a bad Bible joke. Laugh, somebody. Come on. And uh, they're just putting it in more common vernacular, right? But some people are like, bless God, if it's not King James Version... I actually, when I was a kid, listened to the Christian radio with my dad because he was on the radio for years, and this guy was preaching one day, and I was a kid and knew better than that. He was like, bless God, the King James Version is the only Bible. If it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. I'm like, well, first of all, wait a minute. Paul lived way before the King James Version of the Bible. But anyway, so what happened was when they were translating the Bible, they Used, they, they came to this word apostasia, and they transliterated it into apostasy, right? And in English, an apostasy it means a rebellion from a religious belief, a falling away from a, a, a religious belief. 
And so when I say transliterating, I'm talking about they didn't take the passage and translate it based upon the context of what Paul was saying. They just went to that one word and they just transliterated it. They took it straight from Greek and put it into English. And so this word apostasia means falling away, but in Greek it means multiple things like disappearance is one of the meanings of it, a departure. They took it and they made it apostasy in English. So in Greek, the word apostasia means multiple things, but in English, apostasy only means one thing. An apostasy is a rebellion and a falling away from a faith. And so what happens is that um, it was a mistranslation, and it's led to this idea that the, there's going to be this great falling away from the faith, and it's in this time of great rebellion that's going to allow the Antichrist to come. But it makes it sound like, if you understand it that way, that this rapture event, that God's going to snatch us away, we have to go through all this tribulation events because the world's falling away from the faith and all these things is happening. But uh, that's not exactly what it means. Because if you, if you see that the word apostasy or falling away from the faith, uh, we see that, that Paul told us in the New Testament that that's going to happen through time as the world goes darker. It's a gradual. We already know people are falling away from the faith, right? We already see that. One thing that's very vexing is to see the younger generation in America today leaving the church, not having church. Uh, I, I was listening to a... Uh, uh, a lawyer this week, and he's a Christian lawyer, and it's amazing. This, this teacher had a Bible club after school, and a seven-year-old girl was like, what's prayer? Who is God? Didn't even know what prayer was. Didn't know what God was. Didn't know what the Bible was. We're living in an era today where there is a falling away, but that's not what Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about that these things can't happen until this departure happens first. What departure is he talking about? He's talking about when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is here one day and disappears the next day. Amen? Amen? And so we see that the departure is the rapture of the church. So when he's, now, it sounds funny to say this falling away is the rapture because how, how do you fall away and fall up? I've heard people say that, but that's not the point he's making. He's using a word in context of the, uh, of the coming of the Lord, and he's talking about this disappearance, this departure from the earth that's going to take place. Because notice what he said. He said, the restrainer is keeping the man of sin from rising. Who is the restrainer? Notice it says he, capital H. What does that tell you? That the Holy Spirit is here today. It's the age of the Holy Spirit. It's the age of the church. And as long as the church is here, and as long as God's faithful people are here, and as long as the power of the Holy Spirit is at work among God's people and the church, what happens? It frustrates the plan of Satan. Why does the world hate the church? Why does the world hate the message of the church? Why does the world want to silence and cancel you? Because the truth frustrates their plans. Do you realize that the I think Americans need to sit up and really pay attention. You need to really pay attention. Because the greatest threat facing Americans today is not climate change. It's not Russia. You know what the greatest threat is? It's a surveillance state and a censorship. They know where you are at all times. They know we're here. They know we're here right now. Hey, they're listening. You're like, you're talking conspiracy. Oh, come on now. We already know this, right? And now it's another level up. What is that next level? That next level is it's the, it's the censorship. It's to take it one step further. If you say something against the orthodoxy, we're coming after you. If you're a notable person, especially, we're coming after you. And we're going to silence you. And we're going to cancel you. How dare you speak against the orthodoxy? I'm not trying to sound overly political. I'm just telling you, you don't have to be uh, uh, you don't have to have a PhD in political science to just look and see what's happening. 
What is that? Exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. And so why, in a one world system, so why do they hate the church? And why do they hate the message of Jesus? Because bless God, it restrains. That is why as Christians, we shouldn't be afraid. We need to be bold and we need to be people of faith. And we need to pray into the government. We need to pray into our city, pray into these things. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit in the church is a restraining force. You take that away, guess what? It allows the man of sin to do what he wants to do. It allows him to come on the scene. Come on. Right? So you know what? You and I together, why do we need to be in church? Why do we need to be unified? Why do we need to be together more than ever before? Because the, if one can put 1,000 a flight, two can put 10,000 a flight. If we stick together and have a common faith and believe God and come up against principalities and powers, what happens? Man, it starts to frustrate their plans. Why do you think they wanted to stop Daniel from praying? Daniel was praying three times a day. They wanted him to quit praying, so they set laws to trap him. But guess what? He would always pray at his window facing Jerusalem. Notice what he did. All right, I'm going to go close my window, and I'm going to hide and pray. He kept that window open, and he kept praying. Yeah. Man, we, I, I really feel there's a movement. I was just with a group of pastors meeting with the mayor, and... Uh, just about the need for prayer again. Thank God we have a mayor that, that, that recognizes that, you know, we need prayer back in the church. My gosh. And we need to pray into things. We, for, we have forgotten as Christians the power of prayer. We need to pray into things because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God. Amen? And so my point is, and I'm not trying to uh, get in too much weeds so you're like, I don't even know what you're saying. The point that I'm making is that um, what he's talking about in this passage is saying that the man of sin cannot rise. The Antichrist cannot come until first there is a departure of the church. And so that phrase, falling away, doesn't mean that we're falling away from the faith. It's apostasia, meaning that it's a disappearance, it's a departure. In the New Testament, this word apostasia is used 15 times. Only three times does it mean that you're falling away from a faith, which Paul mentioned to Timothy. He said, in the last days, it'll grow dark, and men will fall away from the truth. We already know that. That's been happening for centuries now. And we see that it's ramping up, obviously, in our day. We already know that. But 12 of the times that it's used, it's talking about leaving a place, departing a person. They departed the temple. You know, it's like spatially. And so what's going to, can you imagine the cataclysmic, crisis is going to happen where millions and millions and millions of people are here one day and the next day they're not here? Come on. What happened? That's the apostasia, not a falling away from the faith. That's the disappearance of the church. Have you ever been at home? And I remember when I was a kid one time, all the cars were home and I couldn't find my mom and dad. And I, I thought I was all alone and I don't know what they were doing, playing a sick trick on me or something. And I didn't know, and I had this thought, oh my God, I missed the rapture. <laughs> I was like, God, I'm sorry, please, just have a second one, real fast, just snatch me up. Okay, I'm the only weird one. Wow, thank you. Wow. But you know what? If you believe that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation or sometime during the tribulation, what does it do? It brings us to point two. It causes you to look for the Antichrist instead of looking for Christ. Come on. You're looking for Christ. I mean, you're looking for the Antichrist. You're not looking for Christ. The Bible doesn't tell us to look for the coming of the Antichrist. He says to keep our eyes looking for Christ. Amen? Amen? So, Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now, now in Scripture, the day of the Lord, if you go back to the Old Testament prophecies, is talking about the coming of Messiah to establish his reign on earth. 
And we know that'll be his millennial reign at the end of the tribulation. So when he talks about the day of the Lord, he's talking about the second coming of Jesus. So when Paul's talking about this disappearance or this departure, he's talking about the fact that the church will be raptured first, then the man of sin's going to come, but then the day of the Lord's going to come, and the Bible calls it the great and dreadful day of the Lord. When you and I show up with the Lord to return to earth, it is going to be one awesome, great, and dreadful day because the Antichrist and his, and his armies and his, uh, all those who are the enemies of God, it is going to be one dreadful day. And so it's so important for you and me today to make sure that we are in the church, we are in the ark, like Noah built his ark for the saving of his house, that we're in the ark of safety And and that is so important for you and me today, that we are looking for the coming of Christ. We are not looking for the coming of the Antichrist. You know, when you look at all the world world events today, what does it do? It starts causing you to look for this and to look for that. And we should be aware of the things that we're just talking about. All these things are concerning, but you know what? What does that should cause us to do is look for the coming of the Lord for his people because the rapture of the church draws near and we have to be ready. The rapture is an imminent event. It can happen at any moment. That means that it could just, you know, when it comes to the second coming of Jesus to the earth, there are certain prophecies that have to be fulfilled. But when it comes to the rapture, the snatching away of the church, the disappearance of the church, there's no prophecy that is needed to be fulfilled. It's imminent. It can happen at any time. And so that's why we have to always be ready, living for the day, so that when that trumpet blast sounds, it's going to be the trumpet blast heard around the world, but it's only going to be heard by God's people who are going to be snatched away. Amen? So we're to be looking looking for the coming of Christ, not having our eyes fixed on looking for the Antichrist. Because guess what? Antichrist is going to be somebody else's problem. Not going to be God's people's problem. I, I hope today I'm not confusing you that I'm blessed, you're, you're being blessed by, by the message. But I just want to encourage you that Paul's talking about in this, in this passage, once this departure happens, Because the church with the power of the Spirit is this restraining force. Once this departure, this disappearance takes place, then the man of sin is going to come. He's going to come with all signs and lying wonders. And we see that we've got to walk in that power so that we're a part of that restraining force and we're keeping those things at bay. And you know where it needs to start? In your own home. Keeping that spirit of Antichrist out of your home. To being having open and honest conversations with your children about what's happening in the world today. You know, I would, our kids are facing issues today that I would have never even known what is being said at, at their age. So Sydney's 12, I'm really blunt with him at 12 because A, kids have access to information like never before and the information they have is in your face and it's, uh, you know, it's, I, I tell him all the time, man, be careful what you watch. Be careful what you're doing online, only because once Satan robs your innocence, you can never get it back. At 12 years old, you can never get that back. And so we have to be a restraining force of the spirit of Antichrist spirit today, and we've got to be that collectively as the church. So I just want to give you real quickly some proof of the pre-tribulation rapture, that this, the rapture, our disappearance on this earth is going to happen. It's actually the rapture that's going to be the thing that precipitates the actual tribulation occurring. Now, we said last week that St. Jerome, he translated the Bible from Greek into Latin in the fourth century. And it went on to become the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. And so where we get this word rapture is from his translation. So when he came to 1 Thessalonians 4, and it, Paul talked about this catching away of the church, this catching, a snatching away of God's people, he used this Greek word harpazo, which means to be caught up. Well, when Jerome translated into Latin, he used the Latin word rapturo, which means the same thing. And that is where the English word we get today, when we say rapture, we just automatically think of when God takes the church home. Well, that's where that comes from. So we, we see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
when Jerome translated this, this Greek word apostasia, which has caused people to think that every, all these people are going to fall away from the faith, and then the, the Antichrist is going to come, and at some point in the tribulation or at the end of it, the church is going to get raptured. It's led to a, 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 a proper understanding of things. This is how he translated it into Latin. He, say, he uses the word, when, it, when he came to the word apostasia, he used the Latin word diseseo, which means departure. He understood that Paul was talking about once the departure of the church takes place, then the man of sin is going to come. Now, in 1384, there was a famous English scholar. His name was John Wycliffe. And I actually mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in a Bible study on a Wednesday night. Remember when Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address? He said, this government of the people, for the people, by the people, shall not perish from the earth. And that phrase, of the people, by the people, for the people, remember, it's become a part of like American consciousness. Do you know where he got that phrase? In the preamble to John Wycliffe's Bible, he wrote, this Bible is, of, is, for, the, is for the government of the people, by the people. Come on, somebody. For the people, of the people, by the people. It was the first... Now. In church, especially when I was a kid growing up in the 80s church, I talk about that a lot. Come on, somebody, the 80s. Come on, great music. Great, great, great stuff. I mean, it was the age of aerobics. Come on. It was all those great things in the 80s. You know, we just, we, I understood King James Version, you know. And, uh, and you always thought, kind of grew up thinking that King James Version was the first Bible in English. But it wasn't. It was John Wycliffe's Bible. And you know what? He actually got killed for it. You know that? Because they didn't want you being able to read the Bible for yourself. They wanted to read it and tell you what they wanted you to believe. That, that's so corrupt, isn't it? They, they want, they'll dictate the information you get. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Right? And so he wrote the first English trans 13, you see, the, you see the list. There were seven English Bibles that preceded King James's version. And notice in every single one of them, what do they say when it comes to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? They say, look at this, Wycliffe Bible, departing. Look at the old English word, how they spelled departing. 1384, departing first. He said, this cannot happen until the, de until the, de the, the departure comes first. Look in 1526, the Tyndale Bible comes out, departing first. 1535, the, the Coverdale Bible, departing first. 1539, the Cramner Bible, departing first. 1576, the Breaches Bible, departing first. 1583, the Beza Bible, departing first. 1608, Geneva Bible, which by the way, was the Bible the pilgrims used. The Geneva Bible, what does it say? Departing first. It wasn't until the King James translators came along and they took the word apostasia and they made it apostasy and that is where they put the word falling away. And from ever, ever since then, we see because of this mistranslation, everybody has this idea that there's going to be an end time event almost. There's going to be this great falling away. Then the man of sin is going to come and then the church is going to have to go through this tribulation. But that's not what Paul was saying at all. And all the previous Bibles and translations all understood what he was saying, that there is a disappearance coming. There is a departure coming, and that departure is the church of the Lord Jesus is going to be caught up and snatched up to meet the Lord in the air, and it's only then that the man of sin is going to be able to rise. So I want to encourage you today that the, right, the rapture of the church is something so awesome, so exciting, that you and I should be living for, expecting, and as Miss Pam was saying earlier, every single day, remind yourself and your children, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming for his people. Amen. We don't have to live in fear. We do have to live in faithfulness. We don't have to live in fear. God isn't going to put his people through the tribulation. He's not going to put his people through the tribulation. He is going to save his people. And just like he shouted out and called Lazarus out of the grave, he is going to shout out and call us up from this world 
before the tribulation. Now, I know I, I've kind of gotten into the weeds a little bit and had a little bit of history there and all the Bible translations. I'm just trying to build a case to tell you that a departure is coming. Amen. A de- disappearance is coming. And what is that disappearance? Is when me and you will no longer be here in the twinkling of an eye. Can you imagine that? As quick as you can blink your eyes, boom. You know how they always say, never let a good crisis go to waste? It's like, have you ever noticed over every crisis situation that happens? It's like uh, we get uh, fearful and scared, right? And what do we do? Because we're afraid, we give up more rights. Let the government take more control because they protect us. What happens? They take more power, more control. Control and more control and more control and more control. And once you have the control, I mean, you don't want to give it away. You don't want to give it up, right? And so, um, and that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to live in fear. He wants us to live in fear. And that's why the Bible says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Because what does fear and panic do? It plays on your mind. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. What does the Word of God help you do? Have, have, have a sound mind in crazy days. Soundness of mind. When the world seems like it's going to hell, the word, the word of God is my compass that keeps me. Now here's the thing. I'm going to close with two, two passages of Scripture. Going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says this, verse 9, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven. No, what? 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 Wait for his Son from heaven. What is Jesus going to do in the rapture? He's going to come from heaven down into the clouds, and he's going to be like, yo! I'm just trying to give Jesus street cred for today. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What is the wrath? In the Old Testament, the tribulation is referred to as the wrath of God. We see it throughout Scripture. The the tribulation is called the wrath, the wrath of God. What does it say here? Jesus is going to come from heaven. Why? Because he's going to deliver us from what? The wrath that is coming. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 5. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. What is the day of the Lord? It's the, it's the second coming of God. It's going to be like a thief to those who have rejected God. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Verse, and skip down to verse 9. It says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, God has not appointed you to the wrath that is coming on the world. Now look, in the tribulation, there will be people that will be saved because they will recognize, oh shoot, those crazy Christians weren't crazy after all. You know, Noah was crazy for 120 years until it started to rain and he sailed off like, (laughs) reminds me of the old Speaking of 80s, sailing takes me away. Anyway, what did did he have? He had a boat. What did he do? He escaped. Rapture isn't just escapism. It's called being smart. It's it's the ultimate life insurance. Sorry, Logan. It's it's, it's He's got a policy for that too. You know, it's like... (laughs) I'm telling you, Being born again is entry into the ark. Amen? They escape the wrath of the flood. God's faithful people today are, guess what? Are going to escape the wrath that is coming on the world. Now, there will be people who will be saved. We even read in Revelation that God's going to raise up 144,000 young men, Jewish young men, and they're going to lead a global revival, and it's going to tick the Antichrist off because he can't kill them. Isn't that awesome? So there's going to be a revival even in the tribulation. 
Because people are going to be like, look, we didn't listen on that side, but now we, you, you got our attention. The point I was making earlier about the government taking more, every time there's a panic and a crisis, more, more control, can, can you imagine what the rapture will do? It'll be a cataclysmic crisis like the world's never seen. And people will be in such fear, and here comes the slick guy with all the answers. And just, he will just complete control over the world. They'll, give up, let, they'll let him have control over the world because the system has already been built for him to just take the place and start ruling and reigning over, over the world. And so it's crazy. It? it sounds something like out of a movie, and that is why the Bible is so friggin' awesome. I mean, come on. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. But it's mind-blowing how God has already made a way of escape for his people so what do we do between now and then? Uh, stay faithful is one, but also occupy. Jesus said, occupy till I come. That doesn't mean, now I remember when I was a kid, there was this, I don't know, today's the 80s theme. I don't know, but 1988, there was this book written by a guy, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. It was so stuck out in my mind, I remembered it. I was 12 years old, and I was like, everything I did that year, God forgive me for that. I repented immediately, you know. God forgive me for that. I'm sorry, you know. And I remember, I mean, our neighbors, everybody started going to church, started serving God, because they had read that book, and bless God, they knew Jesus was coming. 88 reasons why he's, anytime, no one knows the day or the hour, right? So when you start putting dates on it, you're like, reader beware, Right? Well, guess what? It didn't happen. And what happened? A falling away happened. Because people were like, got all worked up. I got to get right. And then the guy came back out the next year. He's like, yo, my bad. It's 89 reasons <laughs> why Jesus is coming back in 89. See, what had happened was I had missed something. And here we are all these years later. Right? But in the second coming, we know exactly when Jesus is going to come back, right? The moment the Antichrist starts that second phase of the tribulation, when he goes into the temple in Jerusalem and he sacrifices, uh, and, and he goes in and makes himself God, right? And he talked about, so he's going to show himself he's God. 42 months later, it's three and a half years, 42 months later after that, Jesus is going to come back. So it's like, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. No, you don't know when the rapture is going to be. We know exactly when he's coming back to the earth. It's going to be 42 months later from the time that the Antichrist makes himself God. So the Bible tells you exactly. The thing we don't know is the imminent snatching away of the church. That's why we want to be faithful. Amen? And that's why we want to be an overcomer. I hope that blessed you today. I hope that was encouraging to you today. I hope it wasn't. I know it had, some, it, it had a little Bible college kind of a feel to it, but you know what? Praise God. Let's stand. I'll stop. Just keep building that boat. Stay faithful to God. Don't let the things of this world cause you to be so distracted that you start getting out of place. Let's stay faithful, amen? Let's stay fervent. That's the thing. Once you start losing some fervency, it starts causing you to not be faithful. And I really do believe that God is calling his church to pray again. To pray again. My house should be called a house of prayer. Why? Because we still have to stand. Here's the thing I don't want to put a false impression in your mind that we're just escaping. It's all an escape. You know what? We, God put a fight in his people and we have the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit and faith that we're to stand against. Paul said we are to wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but we are to wrestle against principalities and powers. And so, you know what? We need to start wrestling in prayer against these things, amen? and against the principalities and fight them to the very end so that when that disappearance happens, they're like, Whew, I'm glad those people are gone. Right? Amen? 
And if you're here today and you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's an insurance policy you need. If you're watching online today and you never prayed, I'm telling you, that is how you get in the ark of safety. Because when that rapture shout happens, we are going to all be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And I just want all of us to just repeat this prayer, this salvation prayer together. If you're watching online and you've never prayed to receive Jesus, just repeat it with me right where you are. And we're going to believe with you and stand with you as you give your heart to the Lord. Just say, Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your son Jesus, that he was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross for my sins. He was buried, and you raised him from the dead on the third day. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I repent of my sins. I give you my life. And I ask you to come into my heart and save me and make me new. And I commit to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, would you slip up your hand? Amen. Praise God. If you're saved and you know it, somebody give Jesus a shout of praise. Come on, amen. Give him a shout of praise. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the kingdom of God. And we ask that you would log on to our website at searchchurch.tv and to fill out that, uh, go to our I Made a Decision page, fill out that form. We'd love to get in contact with you, help you grow as a disciple of Jesus. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing the ministry of Search Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you. Stay connected together. We will surge.